Okay, uh, thanks very much, Steve. Great to see you all here. Um, really good to see so many people interested in uh, science and the science of bushfires. Um, now, tonight we're going to hope to keep it pretty lively. Uh, the basic idea is that we're going to talk about various myths to do with bush bushfires. You guys, you have your clicker pads there, and I reckon there's a challenge there to see if you can do something with them. You say they can't be destroyed other than living without them, but I've never met a piece of technology that can't be. But, um, so you'll have the clicker pads. You'll be interacting with the questions, so you get a chance to see if you can pick the myth, pick the fact from the fiction, and see what everyone else thinks. Uh, we'll also show a few clips from Catalyst that hopefully you'll learn something from. Um, and then we'll have a panel discussion here about the various issues involved. Now, I know you'll all be champing at the bit to ask questions throughout that, but what we're doing just to sort of keep the whole thing flowing is we're going to keep questions to the end. So the last 20 minutes or maybe more, it's over to you guys to, to ask all your questions. So uh, let's get it moving. I'll first of all introduce these guys. Uh, Kevin Tolhurst, who's sitting right next to me here, uh, is Senior Lecturer in Fire Ecology and Management in the Department of Forest and Ecosystem Science, University of Melbourne, based in Creswick, and a member of the Bushfire Cooperative Research Centre. Karen, uh, Kevin's current research activities are centred around developing a bushfire risk management de decision support system to be used nationally. His work has been a core activity in the Bushfire Cooperative Research Centre since 2003. Justin Leonard, sitting next to him, oh, you're in all in order of this, that's very good, uh, is a CSIRO researcher focusing on how bushfires interact with urban assets. Justin has conducted extensive post-bushfire survey, surveys of past events and has conducted a wide range of small, medium and full-scale bushfire exposure experiments on buildings. Sounds like he sets fire to stuff to me. Uh, firefighting appliances and domestic vehicles. Communicating this body of knowledge to the relevant government agencies and the community is also a key focus of Justin's research effort. And finally on the end, we have Drew Dawson, uh, is nationally and internationally recognised for his contributions to the scientific community and to industry in the areas of sleep and fatigue research, organisational psychology and human factors, industrial relations negotiations and human implications of hours of work. Uh, now with regard to bushfire situation, his research primarily focuses on developing risk management frameworks that, that assist in identifying fatigue as a safety hazard for emergency surface Personnel, personnel. More widely, he has also conducted research into the human factors involved in perceived risk, which will be really interesting to talk to him about tonight, using uh, during incident management situations. All right, well look, I think right now we should test these clicker pads. So if you take them into your hands, even we have them. Um, now you can't send texts or make calls or anything like that, or so I'm told. Um, but you can push numbers, and so basically you just have to push a number on these kinds of questions. And this is a pretty easy one, I think. You shouldn't have too much trouble with this. It's got to be truthful. Uh, it has to be truthful, I'm afraid, yeah. Uh, so if you just do that just to uh, demonstrate the technology works, I guess. I, oh, we've got thinking music even. Do you need this much? <laughs> Okay, and there's the results. Okay, males 18 to 35, that's uh, very good. All right, well look, we're, uh, we've got a next one now. Uh, so the questions are getting a little more difficult. Hopefully this one won't tax you too much. Now the thinking music again. Adelaide Fringe and Foothills, 45%. Uh, very interesting for a bushfire discussion. Uh, okay. Now, this one, maybe this one is a little harder, I don't know. This is one that uh, might get you to think a little more. Do you have a bushfire survival plan? And you have to be honest here.
And the answer is, uh, yes, 43% claim they have. 18% have been very honest. That's good to see. 24% have come to make their decision tonight, I guess. And developing my plan. That's, that'll be my answer, I suspect. Yeah. Good political answer. I don't know. I'm assuming you guys have all uh, pushed number one, but uh, I don't know. Well, now you have your uh, first real question for the evening. A myth there. If there hasn't been a fire for a while, number one, is it less likely there'll be one? Just not fires in these parts. Uh, number two, the next one will be huge and will destroy all plants, animals and everyone in its path. Or does climate change mean all bets are off now? What we you know, knew in the past is now different. Um, or number four, there'll be a small fire and the CFS will come and put it out promptly without fuss. Yes. CFS members laughing there, is that? <laughs> um, and uh, Department Envi of Environment and Natural Resources should do a prescribed burn. So there's your thinking music. Okay, <laughs> there, well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's voter confidence in CFS. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's lovely. Uh, I'm sure it's completely untrue. Uh, who, would, who would like to open discussion? What about you, Kevin? Well, look, I think uh, one of the biggest challenges for us as a community is to accept that fire is part of the environment, and we've got to see how both we live in that fire-prone environment, but also how we maintain the environment that we that love out there uh, with the use of fire. So fire has to be part of the picture. And we can learn a lot from the, the plants and animals that live there to work out how often, what season, uh, what sort of intensities we uh, burn the fires, uh, conduct fires. So in, the answers here are largely political, so it's very hard to answer that from a scientific point of view. But I think uh, we need to do... We, we've got a lot of knowledge already that we can make some good decisions on whether or not we should be prescribed burning. OK, Drew, tell me about um, risk perception as it pertains to this. Yeah, I think it's a really important issue. <coughs> Communities struggle sometimes with understanding risks, particularly risks that are diverse. So one of the things that you'll find is when an individual householder looks at the risk of a fire, it can actually be quite low. That is, the chances of me being burnt out tomorrow are quite low. But for the CFS or for the government, the probability of the fire is quite high. So you have people approaching it from very different perspectives. And for most people, not doing anything turns out to be enormously rational. But it's because the chances of something happening are quite low. Um, and to do something every time to protect something that isn't going to happen becomes irrational. So we know a lot about the psychology of risk perception and how it distorts behaviour in the face of low probability events. The other thing, and this would come back to Kevin's point, is, is that I think we need to approach this as an educational issue and something that kids grow up with and is start and forms part of their normal education in the same way as that we're starting to move to introduce occupational health and safety into the curriculum for many people around the community. I think in those communities where the risk is quite high, we need to start to think about how do we actually make this part of the normal dialogue. At the moment, we have the issue that is bushfire is this catastrophic thing I don't want to think about. And the, then as a result, we tend to go, oh, it's so scary, I'm not going to think about it. What we actually have to do is mainstream that dialogue so it becomes a narrative that's part of the normal daily routine in those communities where it's an issue. So we don't put it out of our minds and hope it won't happen. OK, just before we move on, have we got... Uh, is that alien hum in my own head, or can you hear it as well? <laughs> is it? Uh, it's not the ice machine, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Someone's motorbike. Oh, it's a motorbike. Oh, yeah, right. I'm glad it's not in my own head then. Um, uh, well, Justin, what the, what's the correct answer to the question? Well, uh, as uh, Kevin pointed out, it's a little bit of a political range of, questions, of answers yeah. to uh, attempt. But I guess from my perspective, when you talk about uh, fuel reduction or prescribed by fire and community risk, um, the, the actual fuel loads right up against the urban interfaces and around people's houses is is the fuel load that's going to have the biggest impact on those individual risks, right? Um, and, and then the further away you move from that point, you have a lesser and lesser uh, impact. So if you divide up the problem into um, types of prescribed fire, um, where is it? Is it interface um, fuel reduction? Is it broad acre burning? 
and start to break down the, the problem that way, I think uh, everyone can make a lot more sense of this very broad topic. Okay, is it a case, um, you know, with, with risk perception that, you know, you might have a fire in an area that, you know, happens maybe once every hundred years, and even though people kind of know it at one level, like it's, it will happen, if, you know, if there hasn't been a fire in kind of your lifetime and you've got to your mid-40s, you sort of, you subconsciously think, well, there's no risk here. Is that a big issue we have to deal with? Maybe Drew. I think the discrepancy in risk perception at the individual level versus the community level is a major one that we have to address from a social perspective. But I also think the notion that the risk is borne differentially by different people in the community is always an issue. So, for example, the discussion about should we burn off in order to prevent 10 people dying in a bushfire has to be weighed up against what would be the consequences of smoke inhalation for the population of Melbourne in the same situation where we might kill twice as many people. That is that there is a whole range of risks that the community needs to weigh up and what's good for one group may not necessarily be good for another group and weighing up those values is ultimately, as Kevin pointed out, a political process and should we save 10 people dying from a bushfire and is it acceptable for 80 old people, for example, to die of respiratory illness as a result of that? Now, I'm not saying they're the actual numbers, but I'm saying sometimes we don't necessarily think about it as a broad political ecosystem. We get fixated on a knee-jerk response to one problem without thinking what are the opportunity costs associated with solving that problem? And they're not easy discussions for the community. Indeed, that's sort of an issue with the environmental problems in general, isn't it? Yes. That you sort of focus on solving one lot of problems and then, you know, create a whole lot of other problems like, yeah. you know, with the low energy light bulbs, for example, where you're reducing CO2 emissions, but maybe you're increasing other pollutants in the, in the landfill, those kind of issues, you're weighing up different things. Well, I think it's been famously said that most public policy is about problem shifting, not problem solving. <laughs> Uh, Kevin? I, I think one of the things that Drew's touched on here is really important. The, the, the Royal Commission in Victoria, one of the, the big findings I reckon all, uh, that came out of it was this need for shared responsibility, where it said shared responsibility doesn't actually mean equal responsibility. It actually means that uh, the community, for example, has to take greater responsibility for some of the community uh, arrangements and that the government needs to take uh, greater responsibility in other areas. But in doing that sharing, we need to have a, a clear picture of what our shared values are. And we don't have that discussion very well. It tends to be in a competitive sort of uh, format. So we'll have uh, one lot basically saying, one, one group of people basically saying, well, the environmental values are paramount. Someone else says, well, my family and, and uh, my home is my what's paramount. Someone else will say, no, the water catchment values are paramount. Someone else will say the, water, uh, the, the air quality is paramount. We don't have that discussion, really, and I think um, the challenge that's been put in uh, after the Bushfire Royal Commission in Victoria is to start having that engagement. And in real engagement means that both sides basically will be changed as a result of that discussion and that engagement. It's not a matter of um, this is what's best for you and best for the environment or whatever and this is what we're going to do, you just need to understand what we're doing. That real engagement, I think, is a, a, quite a different way to what we normally work. And that's where we need to share that responsibility, not so much our own level of risk, but the risk to the things that we value in the, the landscape and what we value in our communities. We, we haven't actually done, done that yet. How do you compare those things? It's kind of like comparing apples and oranges, really, isn't it? Well, I think, you know, in our society, we, we do have governments that sort of uh, are there to, to try and balance that. So in, in a sense, it's a true political sort of uh, debate we need to have, but we need to sort it out in our own communities to start with. So we have a vested interest in, in the sense that it's going to affect our power supply, it's going to affect our home, it's going to affect our landscape. So we already have that vested interest there. Um, we need to facilitate that and I guess one of the recommendations again of the Royal Commission was that the Country Fire Authority in Victoria needed to be more of a community organisation. And to me that didn't mean more volunteers out on the back of trucks, it actually meant that was part of it but there's also the community needs to be assisted, if you like, in having these discussions. And this is a great example, I guess, of, of kicking that off, but uh, having 100 people at a group like this is, is just the start of that process. Yeah. OK, look, very good. Let's, uh, let's move it on to our uh, next question here. Now, this is slightly different here. You just have to say whether you agree or disagree or something in between. So you just hit a number one to five, um, and one is you totally agree. When there is a fire, 
or you burn the bush deliberately, all animals die and bush is destroyed. And the answer is... Okay, so, disagree. I totally disagree. All right, very interesting. Well, let's go quickly. These have to be very quick answers, these ones. But Justin, what, what's your thoughts there? Uh, I think the, the audience is well across the issue. It's um, the bush is well adapted. Um, it's, it's a regenerative process. It's a nece necessary part of our environment. And I think uh, the take home message is the community, um, the community must uh, embrace the idea that fires are part of the landscape and a part of their um, their set of social values and they, they should act accordingly. True. I don't cool. think I can add anything to that. Though. Yeah. What uh, about you, Kevin? Yeah. Well, I, I guess I would just say that um, we need to think of the impact at a population level, not an individual level. Yes, certainly individuals will be killed as a result of the fire, but if it means the, the longer term uh, viability of the population, then that's actually a good thing. So we need to be looking at a longer term, longer landscape, uh, larger landscape to be able to actually assess this and I think the audience have done a tremendous job in actually uh, sorting that out. And, and do we need to do a lot more research on you know what kinds of bush as we saw in the, the catalyst clip there about what kinds of bush need to be burnt when and that sort of that is that knowledge um, readily available or is there still a fair bit of research to be done? <laughs> I'm a researcher. So so yeah. Always researcher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, there's, there's thousands of publications out there about the, the results of this. We know an uh, enormous amount, but one of the things we always find out as we do research is that there's more needs to be known. So it has to be an ongoing uh, study because our environment is constantly changing. Uh, we affect it. So yes, we need more research, but there's plenty of research there to always already give us uh, a direction as to where we should go. Okay. Well, we have another quick question now. If prevention is done properly, there will be no more major bushfires. And the answer is 53%. Uh, well, Drew, what have you got to say about that? <sighs> <laughs> You push number one. <laughs> <laughs> Look again, I, I think it's really interesting and it's going to depend a lot on what you mean by a major bushfire and all of those kind of things. But, you know, fire is a natural, inevitable and persistent element of the landscape. And I think the fact that you think it can go away you, is naive in a funny kind of sense. And the only way you could go make it go away would be to destroy the environment in a funny kind of way. So I think it's about teaching people to live with fire rather than to create some false illusion. And, and again, coming from the social sciences area, this, this, this kind of naive notion that humanity or man can create agency and control and can completely control the environment, which has been a dominant thought, at least in Western thinking, for the last 150 years, I think we're starting to realise is that we've been playing with ourselves. Mm -hmm. That is, that this notion that somehow everything is available to us to control and we can manage it all if we just do enough research or we just have enough money or those kind of things is, is naive. I think, you know, the planet's biting back. Justin, what do you, what do you think of, um, you know, some of these areas that were burnt out really badly in, say, Victoria recently? Sh should there be areas where you say, no, look, people shouldn't build homes there? It's just... To the fire risk is too high. Um, oh, I guess my, my perception is that there's always a way that you can live with the risk of, of a fire event. Um, there might be some very discreet areas where it's not economical or not um, not viable for for an enjoyment of your quality of life to live in a house in an area in a certain location. But um, no, I don't think an exclusionist policy is an answer. I think it's all a case of compromise and measures and risk management. Risk isn't something you can eliminate completely or you'll end up uh, compromising many of our other values in life if, if you did attempt to push the economic sliders or the, uh, 
the policy slide is right to the to the limits that they can they can be taken. So, you know, prevention we can't prevent uh, fires in the landscape. Half of them are, are ignited through natural means anyway. So if we can work out how to stop lightning, then we might be heading in the right direction. Are any of you guys working on that lightning problem? <laughs> <laughs> Global cooling. Yeah, right. Right. And, and I'm sure, um, as uh, was alluded to here, if you did eliminate, eliminate them out of the landscape, um, some other ugly monster is going to rear its head yeah. and bite you back because you're, you're playing with things that uh, shouldn't be tinkered with.